Welcome to Bits and Bytes. Over the last 11 episodes, my role has been to present all the basic information about microcomputers that the experts have prepared for us. Armed with this information, we should now know enough about computers to be able to start thinking seriously about some of the questions that they raise. And that's what our final program is all about. Where is all this going? What are the implications for the future? What next? Well, you've shown me so many things that I can do with a computer. My accounting, my filing, I can talk to other computers, I can learn new subjects, do graphics and music, word processing and financial forecasting. As a matter of fact, I could spend all my time just sitting and typing and staring at the screen of one of these machines. But are there any dangers in doing this? Well, this is a question that concerns a lot of people. So we've checked it out with our consultants and with all the experts that we've talked to during the production of the series, and what they all agree on is this. There is no evidence so far of any harmful radiation from the computer screen. Well, that's good to know. But precisely because the computer is so versatile, there is a temptation to sit at it for too long. And this can obviously lead to poor posture, backache, eye strain, and so on. Hmm. Yes, but so can sitting at a typewriter all day long. But if you work with a typewriter, you have to get up every now and again to file something or to mail a letter or you may simply change position to use a calculator or talk on the telephone. But with a computer, all these things could be done without moving at all. So if you're using a computer, you must make a conscious effort to get up and move about at least every hour or so. Well, that makes sense. Now I have another question. Software. Most of the actual material that I've been using on the computer has come on a cassette or a disc. And I know that you can get larger ones, these hard disks. But is this basically the form that ready-made programs will take in the future? Some people feel that the video disc may be the next step. Integrating the video disc with the computer is one of the projects that they're working on at the Ontario Institute for Studies in Education. The video disc that we're using in this project is called an optical video disc. It's read by a laser beam. It contains 54,000 still frames of video information or up to 30 minutes of continuous video play, which allows us to provide color, motion, computer graphics, animation, and to store the computer programs on one video disk. So there's one medium that the user or the student has to handle. The disks are manufactured by a very expensive process. They typically start out with broadcast quality videotape materials on which you encode all of your information. The videotapes are then played, which modulate a laser beam, which actually burns small pits through a photoresist medium, very similar to the way that integrated circuit chip masks are made. Once that's done, they go through several replicas, making reverse molds of it. And the process that's being used quite a lot now is an injection molding process. Some things on the disc happen very quickly. In order to see them more closely, go back and play them in slow motion, or stop them altogether. Now coming up is the Kid Disc Countdown Gizmo. Always wait until you see the end, and then... Stop the picture. Once you've stopped, use the still button to go forwards or backwards, step by step, and see lots of different jokes and picture puzzles. There are several advantages to using the disk. The disk itself will store the capacity of 111 floppy disks. The disk has the capacity for freeze framing, for playing backwards and forwards in slow motion or in regular motion, or very quickly randomly accessing a particular frame. The video disk can sit on a single frame for a very long period of time. And if your function is to individualize the instruction, so that the instruction is there as long as the student wants it available, then it's much easier to do on a video disc. The first disc that we produced 
is designed to support machine shop instruction. Welcome to single point thread cutting. The four major parts of the lathe are the headstock, the quick change gear mechanism, the carriage, and the tailstock. The module is intended to supplement the classroom instruction and perhaps even replace that small portion of the class, which is the demonstration. The advantage in this case is that the student has their own presentation of the information. It can go at their own pace and tailor the instruction to that particular individual. It's very early to make any decisions about the instructional advantages for video disc other than those that are mostly theoretical at this point in time. We did find in our field trials that student achievement was very significantly improved over the traditional method of classroom demonstration. We don't really expect much difference in terms of the educational benefits between the interactive videotape and the video disc. The only advantage will be probably slightly lower cost and better reliability. You know, it's amazing the huge quantity and variety of information that you can get on a video disc, especially information for the computer. Yes, but don't forget that we've also seen another way of getting programs or data into the computer, over the telephone. Ah, yes, of course. Modem and telephone. And that lets you move information in or out of the computer. And nearly everyone has a telephone. But we're also hooked up electrically with the outside world in other ways. You mean nearly all of us also have a television set, for example? That's right. And just as you can marry the computer and the telephone, so you can marry the computer and the television. Teledon is a way of getting words and pictures from large data banks to appear in your ordinary home TV set. There are two different ways of doing this. They are called videotext and teletext. With videotext, the information is sent over the telephone to your television set. With teletext, the information is broadcast straight to your TV, just like any other television program. If you fiddle with the vertical hold on your TV set, you'll see a gap between the pictures. This is where the teletext messages go. Teletext is like a magazine, which broadcasts its pages at you, repeating them over and over again every few seconds. Once you have a Teledon decoder and a keypad, you can choose any page you like by grabbing it as it flashes by. Teledon is two-way communication. You interact with the information. You can pick and choose what you're going to see. It isn't just a one-way stream of information that you have no control over. You can browse through the Teledon messages that are available to you, just as you can browse through a newspaper or a magazine. You simply work through multi-choice menus to get at the messages that interest you. Teledon is the latest in a series of techniques for getting information to appear on TV sets. Earlier versions in Europe included Prestel and Antiope. But Teledon pictures are sharper and crisper than any previous system. And they can be drawn and transmitted more easily and quickly. It's quite easy for non-programmers to design Teledon pictures. The images are composed of several basic elements that are drawn directly using, for example, this graphic tablet or this marker position. Let's, for example, try to draw a rectangle. I just give the point of departure of the rectangle and the diagonal point of a rectangle. If I don't like the place where I've drawn the rectangle, I can take it and move it somewhere else on the screen. I can also leave it where it is and copy it somewhere else. I can also erase any element on the screen. For example, I will erase the top square. I can also modify anything in the rectangle, like the texture or the color. In this case, for example, I will keep only the outline of the rectangle. Now with this very basic shape, I can reflect it and draw a quite complex picture for, from a very simple element.
I can draw some other shapes. For example, now I will draw a circle. I just choose the color. I want a green circle. Here is my circle, which appears on top of the first image. Earlier systems, such as Prestel and Antiope, built up their pictures out of blocks of color, like a mosaic. They are therefore called alpha mosaic systems. The pictures they produce are rather primitive and lumpy. Teledon is more flexible. It builds its pictures out of points, lines, circles, squares, and polygons, geometric shapes. It is therefore called an alpha geometric system, and it gives you much better looking pictures. There are all sorts of applications for Teledon, information for the public in hotels, airports, hospitals, banks, schools, museums, libraries. And soon, you may be able to do your shopping and your banking via Teledon. So Teledon can change your TV set into all sorts of things, ranging from an electronic newspaper to a teaching machine. So apart from what I can program myself, the content for these machines can come on cassettes, floppy disks, video disks, via the telephone or via television. Yes, you have quite a lot of options, but don't downplay what you can program yourself. Remember that programming languages are becoming easier to use all the time. Well, I learned to do a little programming in BASIC, and that wasn't too bad. And Logo seemed even easier. But are there any new languages on the horizon that are even simpler than Logo? Well, there is one very interesting system that we haven't talked about yet that will soon be available in microcomputers. It's called Smalltalk. Our research group at the Palo Alto Research Center is involved in the development of software and hardware for personal computing. The information in the computer and the ways of dealing with that information are accessible to you, even if you don't know a lot about what computers are about. We don't think about computers as simply things for manipulating numbers or places in which you can present words, but we combine the numbers and the words with good visual presentation, nice pictures, graphics, and also sound. In terms of techniques for accessing information, a key presentation technique we've used is to divide up the display screen into rectangular areas or parts that people like to call windows. And so they're windows onto information. The primary kind of window that we like to talk about is one that we call a browser. We do this because too often we think of computers as being very precise machines in which you have to precisely say, I want this or that, and you get it back, exactly what you asked for. But the nice quality of a library is that you can walk around looking for something specific, but as you're doing it, you find other things. And that's what browsing is all about. A browser for us is a window cut up into parts, and each of those parts represents an access path to information. So we've been adopting the use of a pointing device called a mouse, which drives a little arrow or cursor on the screen. And you simply put that on the item you want, push a button on the mouse, and it selects that item. So that if I'm doing one thing such as text editing, and I realize, oh, I really can't finish this document because I forgot some information, I don't have to switch context by putting it all away and starting up a whole new program in order to find that information. I simply want to move to a different window on the screen search for what I want, copy it, and paste it into the original document that I was working in. It is important that the language support making simple changes in an incremental fashion so that I don't have to be afraid that if I make the change, my computer's going to blow up. And I think it's that fear that if I make a change, if I do something in the computer, that I will cause something bad to happen is the reason why people are afraid of the machine. We want to have a situation in which we don't have that fear because one of the largest values of computers is that it is a good place in which to explore. And now, let's have a look at a new version of the pilot authoring language, which will make it very easy for teachers to put sounds and pictures into their lessons. What we've done here at the University of Toronto is to take pilot and to embed it within one of those very powerful computer programming languages that is difficult to learn 
but extremely sophisticated in its applications. We've called our system Pilot Sim because, in fact, it simulates the behavior of Pilot. Now, Pilot Sim by itself uh, still does not give enough power with regard to computer graphics, which is typically a very tedious and time-consuming thing to work with. Now, we've put together a computer program that writes other computer programs. It's called Menulay. When you combine Menulay with material that teachers have written using, for example, Pilot Sim, then that gives you a very powerful integrated system because the computer programs that Menulay writes are immediately able to be connected and linked up with computer programs written in Pilot Sim. And now what I'll do is I'll exit to Menulay. This will now enable me to combine this and the other shapes that I have drawn into a titration example. I now take the examples that I've just drawn and lay them out on the screen. I just move this little box on top of an item and up it comes onto the screen. Actually what we can do now is change the color of them. Let's have a yellow burette. Now let's make the flask contain blue liquid to simulate the action of litmus indicator and let's have a nice bright green stand. Now let's change the sizes of them now. Um, to do that we simply point them and the same little gadget that we used to control the size a moment ago will move this now and there it is we've got a nice large stand now that's about the right size for the others so let's move them around now so that they all fit nicely together and now I'll point to try out and I've got several options here I'm using pilot sim I can either run this program in black and white or I can run it in color I'm also using sound effects so now I'll run this and as the program exits you'll see a Monty Python foot coming down and squashing me off the screen and now if we point to the burette, following our instructions, it says added a drop of liquid, and you could hear that dripping noise as the liquid was added. We'll point to it again, and we'll add another drop of liquid. And then finally, one more drop. And as you can see, the contents of the beaker have changed, uh, simulating that the acid has done its trick. The ease with which one can do this is indicative of the ease with which teachers can put together much more sophisticated programs. And as you can see, it's a great deal of fun. So doing graphics with Pilot Sim is almost like using a computer screen as an overhead projector that you can doodle on as you're presenting a lesson. You know, we seem to be getting more directly linked right into the workings of the computer. That's right. Our interactions with the computer are becoming more and more concrete and less and less abstract. Yes, I remember when I used the graphics tablet. I felt as if I were really in contact with the machine somehow. The same was true when I used paddles here to move around musical notes. Well, there's another system that they're working on at the University of Toronto that lets you make both pictures and music even more directly. We've been working on computer music for about five years now. And actually, the works had fairly strong implications, not just for musicians, both professionals and amateurs, but also for educators and for people who use computers in general. The main thing that we've achieved is a new set of tools that allow the composer to basically make his own instruments. What we have up here is a way to sculpt the sounds just by dragging our tracking symbol over top of this space. What you're looking at is a graphical representation of the harmonics that make up the sound. These are the low harmonics, and these are the high ones. I can take them out, and here bring one in. You can hear how the effect. This is how sounds are made up in nature, and this is how we can shape them using the computer. Shaping sounds like this may seem like a fairly fancy operation, but actually, most personal computers that are entering the schools right now have this type of capability. In our lab, of course, we can go much further than this, but this is the foundation of the building stone of much more complex types of sound sculpting and making music. What we see is something very similar to what you would see with regular piano music. Down at the bottom of the screen, we have a menu of options. 
the sounds, that sort of trumpet type sound, I actually sculpted myself. One of the main things we have in this program that I find interesting is the ability to have notational flexibility. So what's interesting about this notation is that it shows the contours of the sounds themselves. The notation reflects new ways of thinking about music. And the notation can grow in complexity along with the student's abilities. And what's true for working out musical ideas is true for working out mathematical ideas, for example, or geographical ideas. It's a good environment for learning. Well, if there's one thing to notice, it is the absence of my use of the typewriter type keyboard. The fact is, is that for most of what we do with computers, we can do it using far more natural gestures than typing on a keyboard. When you point at a tablet, you have various types of devices that you can hold that are the connection between your hand and the computer. The question is, why am I using something like this, a mechanical device, as an intermediary between me and the computer? Why can't I go directly and use the touch sensitivity of my fingers? And what I'm going to show you is an experimental graphics tablet. It's a one-of-a-kind, which we've been developing here. And what I've done right now is I've hooked up a sound to the computer so that the signals that are sensed by my touch are converted into sound. The main point to remember is the tablet doesn't make the sound. I could be just as easily controlling pictures, models, video games, or whatever. The touch sensitive device is like finger painting and something that a child can work with. And it's also something which doesn't have mechanical parts. It's peanut butter proof and it's far more intuitive and natural and easy to use. One of the things we can do with this type of device is customize it so it can imitate what would normally be done by these more specialized devices such as the piano keyboard. What I've done is cut out a template to make a little synthesizer console. And here I've got one slider that controls the pitch and the timbre, the richness of the sound. And the vibrato, for example, here and the speed of the vibrato. And I can add a second sound. Change its pitch. A third sound. And a fourth sound. And I can turn them all off. What's exciting about this kind of approach is not only what it costs, which isn't very much, but what it eliminates. We can eliminate typing and use the potential of the computer's intelligence or programmability to do the mundane tasks and let us get on with that job that we adopted the computer for in the first place. So you can paint sounds with your fingers. It's like a sort of musical finger painting, and you can play what a picture sounds like. It, it's incredible. We see that the computer really bridges the gap between sounds and vision. It all becomes part of the same experience. My last question is really a very broad one. What effect will a computer and all these new developments have on education in general? How will the role of the teacher be affected? How will the role of the school be changed? The computer technology has really run riot. Everything around us almost has got computers in it. It's just that we take them for granted. We will not be able to prevent the appearance in every home of these personal computers. I think we should be concerned about computers and how they influence our lives, just as we should be concerned about nuclear energy. Right now, we do not have an adequate number of computers in the schools. Well, I, I certainly don't see one computer for every student in, in the class. That's what industry thinks the, the uh, educational setting ought to be five years from now. But but I can't accept that scenario. We'll probably see more computers in schools with greater capability, particularly in the area of exercising logical problem solving. I think one of the most important impacts that the microcomputer is going to have is in changing the way we structure education. And then the person Our vision is of a school effort, and a classroom and kids and the teacher standing up there being the delivery system for information, all of which can be transmitted through the computer. The computer isn't going to change the fact that kids aren't born knowing history, but it may change the way we deliver the facts of history. All of that material can be transmitted on a demand basis to 
an individual's home, a computer teleconferencing classroom. It's something we can't forget about in all of this wonderful technological change that's taking place around us, that we still need interpersonal relationships, people to people. I think we're going to see the information component of education largely committed to media. And we're going to see teachers working as social directors, role models, facilitators, therapists, values communicators in a way that they don't have time to do now. What we have to do in education is decide what it is that we want the computer to be doing in the classroom. This perhaps is one of the issues teachers face. There's a lot of software coming out. Where do you start? Especially if you're basically computer illiterate in terms of programming. Well, that's not a problem. You can use the software and be computer literate in terms of its usage. Teachers will be preparing computerized learning materials, but not from the point of view of actually programming it in BASIC or Pascal. They will be using programs which have been prepared and they will be modifying them, molding them, setting them up to work for their own particular classroom. When you learn to program a computer, you're not really learning a skill which is intrinsically important to later life. You're learning a logical system that teaches you how to think. That's the real value of the computer. Children will have a lot more questions to ask, and they'll be the sort of questions that I, as a teacher, really enjoy answering because that indicates that a child is actually understanding, not just digesting. We, we've got some real advantages here. The computer can interact with the student. We have a fundamentally superior way of teaching. We have to be able to deliver that, though. We have to be able to utilize the technology. And right now, the utilization is, is very weak. We have just a very few programs that really encourage the student to interact. Uh, we're just scratching the surface. We're just beginning to learn how to use it. You know, there's a lot of food for thought there. Do you feel more comfortable with the computer now than you did at the beginning of the series? Oh, yes. I don't think I'm uh, afraid of it anymore. But, of course, I've still got a lot to learn. And we hope we've got you off to a good start. For Bits and Bites, I'm Luba Goy. Goodbye. And I'm Billy Van. It's been fun. Bye. We're sufficiently skeptical about the changes that are taking place. We take a very critical view of them and, and keep ourselves educated. Then we can afford to be optimistic about the future in education, in the home, and in the arts. <laughs>